Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash CanadaX. That's E-H-X. If you support the podcast, you get a bunch of different rewards depending on the tier that you choose. And all the money that you help support the podcast with goes straight into us making great episodes for you. She is one of the greatest scientists in Canadian history and someone whose work is being rediscovered. Her impact on the world of nuclear physics cannot be understated, and she was considered to be on the same level as Marie Curie. She was Harriet Brooks, and today I am looking at her life, along with a wonderful interview with her descendant, Ellen Denny, who is writing a play about her famous ancestor. She will be providing insight throughout the episode, and we will close the episode talking about her play, Wonder, about Harriet Brooks. Harriet Brooks was born in Exeter, Ontario on July 2nd, 1876, the third of nine children to George and Elizabeth Brooks. Her father worked at his own flour mill until it burned down. It was sadly not covered by insurance, and this would hit the family hard. He would have to work as a commercial traveler for a flour firm to make ends meet. As a result of this new job, the family had to move throughout Quebec and Ontario during Brooks' childhood. Eventually, the family would settle in Montreal. The couple would eventually have nine children, and only Harriet and her sister Elizabeth went on to attend university. For Harriet, she would go to McGill University in 1894 at the age of 18. This was a big step as McGill had only graduated its first female student six years previous. Her genius was clear, and she would soon receive a scholarship for her final two years of her degree studies. But oddly, because she was a woman, she was not allowed to have a scholarship for her first two years. Nonetheless, she would graduate with first-class honors and a BA in Mathematics and Natural Philosophy in 1898. Her outstanding performance in mathematics would earn her the Anne Molson Memorial Prize. Sir Ernest Rutherford, considered the father of nuclear physics, was working at McGill University at the time, and Brooks would be the first graduate student in Canada working for him. You know, it's sort of extraordinary to think where she even got the idea to to try it, you know? I mean, I wish I could uncover her diary somewhere, uh, teenage Harriet thinking through, oh, what, what am I interested in? But I think it must have been a pure curiosity, uh, you know, if she was someone who had that kind of brain where you look at the world and you wonder how it works, um, and then she had the drive to to do well in school and get herself to university. And uh, so her and my great grandmother, Elizabeth, her sister, both went off to university. Some of the first women to go to McGill and to go indeed to go to university in Canada at all. Um, So real trailblazers just in that capacity. And then Harriet's field um, studying science was definitely, you know, not what a lot of the first women pursuing degrees were studying. Um, So she was, I think the first woman to get her master's in in physics at McGill. Um, But what made a real difference, I think, was that Ernest Rutherford was at McGill at that time. That was very lucky timing. They had just attracted him. He was already a star international physicist, hadn't won his Nobel Prize yet. Um, But McGill attracted him with a brand new lab. Really, scientists wanted to go where there was great equipment. Um, And Montreal had just built this fabulous lab. So that's what drew Rutherford over. And then he became Harriet's mentor, um, you know, and he recognized right away her talent and chose her as his first graduate student. And I think that that's really what helped springboard her into the international career that she had in her 20s, because he was certainly someone who, you know, was behind her writing every cover letter, making every recommendation, because he did have that kind of power in the field. It was with him that she would study magnetism and electricity and earn her master's degree. In 1899, before the thesis was even done, her work was published in the Transactions of the Canadian Section of the Royal Society. She would then receive an appointment as a non-resident tutor at the Royal Victoria College that same year. In 1901, she became the first woman at McGill to receive a master's degree. Following finishing her degree, Brooks would begin a series of experiments to determine the nature of radioactive emissions from thorium. Her experiments would serve as the foundations of the overall development of nuclear science. 
In 1901 and 1902, Rutherford and Brooks would publish papers in the Royal Society Transactions and in the Philosophical Magazine. Rutherford would put her to work to try to figure out why radioactive thorium was emitting something that could be carried away on air currents. Brooks discovered that this gas was actually radon, and her contributions to the work on Rutherford's work on radioactive decay would help Rutherford win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. Rutherford, for his part, and a huge amount of respect for this man, always gave credit to, for making the discovery, but over time it would become associated exclusively with him. In fact, during a presentation at the Royal Society of London in 1904, Rutherford specifically gave credit to Brooks and her contributions. You know, it's not necessarily everyone who would have bothered to to give her that opportunity because people saw it as a waste of time and a waste of space to give a graduate student position to a woman when how is she going to go on in the field? So, yeah, he was certainly open-minded enough to say, hey, talent is talent, um, and to support her as she pursued her career. So I certainly give him credit for that. But I think at the end of the day, he, he just saw her for her brain, you know, mm -hmm. um, for her skill level. So, yeah. It would seem that 1901 was a very big year for Brooks. Not only did she publish papers and earn her master's degree, she would obtain a fellowship to study for her doctorate in physics at Bryn Mawr College. While there, she won the extremely prestigious Bryn Mawr European Fellowship. Rutherford then arranged for Brooks to take her fellowship at his former lab in Cambridge, and this allowed her to become the first woman to study at the Cavendish Laboratory. Unlike in Canada, where she had amazing support with Rutherford, her supervisor at Cambridge was J.J. Thompson, who was too preoccupied with his own research and usually ignored her progress. Without her mentor at Rutherford, her self-esteem began to fall, and she began to doubt her scientific abilities and her ability to complete her PhD. In 1903, Brooks came back to Canada to resume her position at the Royal Victoria College and rejoined Rutherford. Her research would then be published in 1904. In 1905, she was appointed to the faculty of Barnard College in New York City. In 1906, she became engaged to a physics professor at Columbia University, which would lead Dean Laura Gill of Barnard to respond to this engagement by stating that any engagement would end her professional relationship with the college she was working at. Over a series of letters, Brooks would state that she had a duty to her sex and her profession to continue her work after marriage. She would state, It is a duty I owe to my profession and to my sex to show that a woman has the right to the practice of her profession and cannot be condemned to abandon it merely because she marries. Margaret Maltby, the head of the physics department at Barnard, took Brooks aside, but sadly, Dean Gill had the support of the college trustees who agreed that a woman could not be married and a successful academic. To keep doing her work, she called off her engagement. Possibly because of this whole situation, Brooks would soon find herself moving away from physics at the height of her career. By the end of 1906, she had moved to a retreat in the Adirondacks, run by a Fabian socialist, and it was there she met Maxim Gorky, the noted Russian writer who would be a five-time nominee for the Nobel Prize for Literature. She would then travel with him and a group of Russians to the island of Capri. What's interesting with Harriet is that it condensed into this very rich ten years of her life. Like, this all happened in her 20s in the turn of the last century, which mm -hmm. is like not a normal 20s to have if you're a woman in the turn of the last <laughs> century. Um, and then she went on to lead sort of a quote unquote normal life uh, as a, you know, the head of her household in Montreal and raising her children. So it, it is, I think it's unique in that she, it was condensed into this period of time and then she, uh, she kept quite, you know, secret, uh, secretive about it for the rest of her life. Um, but I think, again, it, it, it must have been her mind, you know, that drew these people to her. Someone like Maxim Gorky, uh, you know, even with the language barrier and the cultural differences, that immediate admiration that he felt for her, and it's palpable in, in some of his writing that summer when he describes her. Just the fact that she was welcomed into that circle, you know, a uh, young physicist in her 20s from Canada, uh, welcomed into this circle of, of revolutionaries, it, it tells you something about her. You know, she could mm -hmm. hold her own, clearly. <laughs> she could hold her own. I would love to sit down and have dinner with her, let's <laughs> say that. <laughs> it was also during this time that she met a giant of physics, Marie Curie. Curie invited Brooks to be one of her staff in Paris. 
While none of Brooks's research was published under her name during this period, her contributions were cited in three articles and she was considered highly invaluable. For her work with Thompson, Rutherford, and Curry, she is likely the only person to have worked for all three Nobel Prize recipients. At this time, she also worked to secure a position at the University of Manchester, and Rutherford wrote her a recommendation on her behalf. In his recommendation, he would state, Next to Madame Curie, she is the most prominent woman physicist in the Department of Radioactivity. Miss Brooks is an original and careful worker with good experimental powers, and I am confident that if appointed, she would do most excellent research work in physics. Oddly, and unfortunately, for unknown reasons, Brooks terminated her physics career at this moment. In 1907, she would marry Frank Pitcher, a physics instructor at McGill, and settle in Montreal. Pitcher had fallen in love with Brooks and wrote her over and over, insisting that she accept marriage to him and take on a domestic life that he said would give her more joy than science. She would finally agree, and Pitcher then left to go mountain hiking for a month, leaving Brooks to plan her wedding. He also insisted that she organize it as a religious wedding. It's hard to know exactly what the decision-making process was for her when she walked away. I mean, uh, that's what I spent a lot of time exploring as I tried to write this play, because it certainly examines that question and that time in her life. Um, but she was facing pretty dismal prospects in terms of supporting herself financially, because even with the position she was getting, um, the pay was so little, and there was no real hope for an increase in salary for a woman at that time. So trying to support herself on the pittance that she was getting um, was a pretty dark and bleak uh, future to be looking towards. Um, at the same time, you know, she was closing in on that marriageable age where it was, it, she was well into old maid territory, to use the term <laughs> of the day, um, and I think probably had a real desire for the experience of having a family and marrying and being back in Montreal with her family, um, her sisters. So I'm sure all of that was weighing on her mind, and, and the option to do both just was not um, presented, you know, and, and that first kind of came down clearly when she was teaching at Barnard College in New York in 1906. This is when the play, my play opens. And she became engaged for the first time um, to a man named Bergen Davis. And her boss said, you know, you're fired the day you're married, basically. So choose. Um, and so that, I think that was sent her a clear message, right? It, mm -hmm. it was always going to be either or. Um, and she ended up, she called off the engagement um, to save her job. But about a year and a half later, um, after a little bit more work and probably a lot more uh, distress over what to do with her future, she became engaged to another man that she had known uh, from her past in Montreal and left physics entirely. While in Montreal, with her husband, she would have three children, but two would sadly die in their teens. She would still be active in organizations of university women, but would never again work in physics. In 1907, she joined the Women's Canadian Club and served as the Honorary Secretary from 1909 to 1912, and as President in 1923. She was also active with the Alumni Society of McGill University. Uh, well, it had, uh, it had its share of tragedy, um, I'm sad to say. Only one of her three children survived to adulthood, um, and he, so I think the son was 16, um, by the time the whole family was gone, because Harriet also died quite young uh, due to complications from her exposure to radioactive materials. Mm -hmm. um, so she probably, they think she had leukemia um, connected to that exposure, um, which of course a lot of those early scientists had those effects. You know, Marie Curie had that as well, um, because they just didn't know what they were dealing with in terms of the, the safety issues. Um, so yeah, there was tragedy. I think, you know, certainly wasn't all of it. She had a very wealthy sister uh, named Edith who had married the president of the Bank of Montreal. And so that family was able to, I think, really, um, support Harriet and her husband. Uh, and she had, I think, a quite a nice quality of life in Montreal. Um, I've been to her house. It's still standing, the, the house that she occupied with her husband. 
Um, yeah, and she stayed, she stayed friends with the Rutherfords her whole life. Um, she stayed friends with Max, Maxim Gorky, the Russian revolutionary who she befriended, which is like another extraordinary aspect of the play and Harriet's story. Um, she befriended that summer in 1906 that the play is set in. Um, so she stayed in touch with some of these people, but largely what her son said um, in the book, he's unfortunately passed away, so I never met him, but he said that she didn't really talk about the, the period in her life uh, when she was an internationally renowned physicist, uh, which is extraordinary to think of now. You know, we, it just wouldn't be the case now, but um, it was a closed chapter in her life. And I think until this book was written in the early 90s, just most people in my family did not really grasp um, what what had happened in her life. On April 18th, 1933, she would pass away at the age of 57. The New York Times would credit her as the discoverer of the recoil of the radioactive atom for her work as one of the first persons to discover radon and help determine its atomic mass. Rutherford, her constant supporter, would write a highly glowing obituary of Brooks in the journal Nature. For many decades, the contributions of Brooks to physics were unknown, but in the 1980s she began to be recognized for her foundational work in nuclear science. She was the first person to show that the radioactive substance emitted by thorium was a gas with a molecular weight of 400 to 100, which was crucial as a discovery because it showed that elements undergo some transmutation in radioactive decay. You know, we have a tendency in Canada to kind of celebrate international figures before we celebrate our own, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be frustrating to see, you know, people time and again honoring someone like Marie Curie, who, of course, was magnificent, um, a brilliant woman in history, but kind of never shine a light on some of the Canadians that we have, you know, um, who did amazing things. So I do think it's changing, though. You know, even in the course of this project, I've seen Harriet's name just come up so much more often on the radar. I think there's a hunger for women's history um, in Canada, but also in other parts of the world. And so I think people are starting to lift those stories up. And also, it's an important time in, in STEM fields, you know, they're really fighting for gender equality, I think, in a, a very meaningful way right now. So there is uh, a hunger also for stories of women in STEM. So I have definitely felt the science community start to kind of wake up to Harriet's story as well. Still important that we put uh, female role models uh, in the physical space for young women. I think it really does impact how... Uh, a young person envisions their future when they can see, hey, look, there is a scientist and she looks like me. I think that has a real power. Um, I also think, though, it, it's not just for women, of course. I mean, I've had so many men tell me they find the story really relatable as well. And I think that that comes down to sacrifice. Um, ultimately, we make choices in, the, in how we spend our time on Earth. And uh, I think a lot of people can relate to this aspect of sacrifice. And you know, you have to give something up to gain that other thing you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and struggling between those two things, whether it's family and career or whether it's another two things. I think we often, we reach forks in the road in life. Um, and how we move forward is, I think, you know, what this play is examining. But I think Harriet in general is just, she's an inspiring Canadian. And uh, I think it's really exciting to to put Canadians on our stages and on our podcasts and, you know, all of that, because so often in a country like Canada, we're celebrating, um, you know, the American this or the European this. Uh, and I think it's really great to look within our own history. Today, the Harriet Brooks Building, a nuclear research laboratory at the Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, is named for her. In 2002, she was inducted into the Canadian Science and Engineering Hall of Fame, and she was a finalist to be put on the $10 bill. Now we'll go to Ellen, who's going to talk about her play, Wonder. Yes, the play is called Wonder. Um, it is based on her life. It stays pretty truthful, actually, to the story. So it's set in the summer of 1906. And that felt like a really dramatic summer in terms of uh, life events for her. As I said, it started with that engagement and the controversy with her job. Um, and then she went from there uh, to an informal socialist colony in the Adirondack Mountains, which is this like crazy <laughs> left <laughs> turn. Uh, and in that, she spent that summer at this um, this beautiful mountain estate, and 
which felt like a really rich setting um, to, to take the piece. Uh, and there, also staying there that summer, was Maxim Gorky, who was exiled from Russia, and they, they formed an immediate friendship. Um, and when I was reading that part of the book, I was just so blown away uh, <laughs> that she had had this personal friendship with this man. Um, and uh, because, you know, like Maxim Gorky was a, like friends with Tolstoy and Chekhov is like my favorite playwright. Like just this, he's an extraordinary figure um, and also a very fun character to write. So I really wanted to put him in the play as well. Um, and it deals a lot with, so the play itself is examining this question of how Harriet wants to move forward with her life. Um, I've tried to take a really modern approach with it. I, I don't want the piece to feel stuffy or like a, you know, like a period piece mm -hmm. can feel um, because I do think that the, the struggle between career and family is something a lot of modern women can unfortunately still relate to. Um, and, and also the fact that Harriet was groundbreaking for her time means that I just feel like her story has to be told in a, in a thing, in a way that has an edge, you know, mm -hmm. a forward leaning way. So I have found an amazing director dramaturg named Sarah Kitts, who has a real, um, modern feel in the theater she makes and she's been really helping to push the piece as well so we play with time a little bit um there are some surreal aspects to the piece uh and we also use a lot of contemporary movement to convey some of the more um abstract sections where harriet is inside her experimental work um and is so I, i'm trying to use the science in a really active way in the play and to mm -hmm. chart her emotional course um through some of the physics research as, as kind of a metaphor. Um, it's been really, it's been really fun to see over the five years I've been writing it, you know, how it has evolved, how the piece has evolved and how the story wants to be told. Well, this is the first play I've written. Uh, I've since written another one uh, called Pleasureville that was produced in Halifax last year. Um, but Wonder, I really started writing because I wanted to tell uh, my Aunt Harriet's story. I felt so strongly about bringing it to the stage and also uh, you know, in general, bringing more complex female voices to the stage. And I knew she was the right candidate for that. Uh, but I start, I come from a acting background. So I work as a professional theater performer across Canada and plays in musicals. And, uh, but I do, I very much have writing in my blood. My mom, Marion Johnson, she's a writer and, and a playwright. And, uh, so I think I always knew I would write, but this was, this was the push to do so. And I'm so glad that I've started because now I can't stop. But, you know, I am completely indebted to the Rainer Canums, um, who are a research team who are now based in Newfoundland, who wrote the book, uh, because their research was completely instrumental to me doing this project. Um, and I highly recommend the book for people who are interested in her life because it's so thorough. Um, and it was written in a time when there were still people alive in my family who knew her. So that, then that window's closed now. So I'm so glad it happened when it did. Uh, but beyond that book, of course, I've gone into my own research. Um, I've done some, some trips as well. I went down to the Barnard College campus in New York, uh, and I've gone up to Montreal and gone to um, the Rutherford Museum there on the McGill campus and also to Harriet's grave and her former house. So it's been – that part of it I find uh, really fascinating. Like, mm -hmm. it's – it's a little like going back to school, but you, you're choosing your own subject, you know? Uh, yeah, I can nerd out on that, and then I have to remind myself to get back to writing this life. <laughs> Information for this piece comes from Wikipedia, CBC, Women You Should Know, Canada's Virtual Museum. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X. If you did, please give a rating and review. You can support the podcast again through Patreon by going to patreon.com slash CanadaX, that's E-H-X, and you can email me any questions you have at CanadianHistoryX at gmail.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.